This video will cover the broad landscape of investment companies, often called mutual funds or just briefly funds. It's the second video of two covering funds. So this video will discuss the most popular types of funds available to investors. There are closed end funds, open end funds, which are mutual funds. And we'll even look within that mutual fund area uh, money market mutual funds, we'll look at hedge funds, exchange traded funds, including leveraged funds, private equity, and REITs, real estate investment trusts. We'll also discuss briefly exchange traded notes, which have the appearance of a fund, but are actually subordinated debt. So the key here is that when you invest in a fund, you are an equity owner for all the funds, except an exchange traded note, you're not an equity holder, you are a debtor. You have lent money to a company, essentially. In general, when you buy into a fund, you become an equity owner. And so to look at it here, let's look at it on a balance sheet. So you have assets, liabilities, and then you have equity. You become an equity holder. Remember, liabilities and equity fund the assets. And so the assets of a fund, almost always the, the big part of it, like 99% of it, or thereabouts will be securities. So this is what you're investing in. You're indirectly investing in all these securities. And so you own a piece, a percentage of this, proportional piece of that. The price in which you buy this equity is called the NAV per share, which we discussed in the previous video. It's your assets minus your liabilities, which equals equity, right? Assets minus liabilities divided by number of shares outstanding of the fund. And that's your equity piece. So when the portfolio grows in value, gets bigger and bigger, your equity gets bigger. And eventually what happens is the fund declares dividends. And when it declares dividends, it pays money out to shareholders and the assets come down. This asset component comes down. Right? And the net asset value drops because you now have money in your pocket as an investor. So with this in mind, let's move forward and look at the various types of investment companies out there. There is a wide variety of characteristics within each fund type that I'm about to discuss. I'll have to make some generalizations to be able to categorize them. That said, there are some commonalities between the funds that I should mention. They serve as common threads that define funds. So commonalities in addition to net asset value we just discussed there's two of them one is that these are pooled investments there's a giant portfolio on the asset side of the balance sheet and it's shared by many many investors on the right hand side of the balance sheet you could conceptually think of it as you know the equity component thousands of shareholders sharing in the same investment so that's what we mean by pooled investments there's also additional commonality that relates to pass-throughs. Investment companies or funds are pass-throughs. Tax laws require that funds distribute at least 90% of their capital gains and dividend and interest income to shareholders. Most funds distribute about 100% of their income. And because they distribute 100% of their income, they're not subject to taxes. So when you look at the income statement, you're not going to find a tax line there. The tax line shows up on the individual's tax returns, like you and I. That income is going to show up on our tax returns, and we're going to pay the taxes based on our personal tax rates. That's what we mean by pass-throughs. So these funds have a net asset value. All of them accept exchange-traded notes. They represent pooled investments that... You know, hundreds if not thousands of investors own a piece of the giant pool of securities. And these funds are pass-throughs. Now, let's talk about closed-end funds. Closed-end funds are usually stock or bond funds, but they can be REITs, which are down below in the list here. Let's think of it in terms of stocks and bonds for now. Closed-end funds do an initial public offering, just like any other company out there, non-financial company, Companies do initial public offerings. They sell their shares. And with these closed-end funds, the reason they're called closed-end is they don't sell any more shares. They're not really open to new investors. So what happens is there's a fixed number of shares outstanding. 
And that's what we mean by closed. They don't increase the number of shares. And those shares trade on an exchange. So you're going to have to buy them through a broker and you will end up buying them from somebody else. You won't buy them from the sponsor. In other words, the company that started up the fund. The motivation for closed end funds is simple. There's no need for shareholder servicing in these funds. So normally what happens is when you open up a mutual fund and you go into a, a complex, a sponsor that like Fidelity or Vanguard that has 100 different funds or more, you call up and you get advice on the telephone. Uh, you answer, they'll answer questions for you. They'll help guide you into what funds you need. There literally could be a huge department of people that man telephones and provide guidance to shareholders. That is very costly. And so the advantage of closed end funds is that they don't have that cost because the shares are just issued and outstanding and they trade between investors. Now, one of the interesting things about closed end funds is that sometimes they trade at premiums or discounts to NAV. So think of it this way. There's an actual underlying value of every share of a closed end fund at any day. There's an actual value, that's the net asset value. It's the assets minus the liabilities divided by the number of shares. But when these shares start trading on an exchange, they could end up selling at premiums or discounts relative to that net asset value, which is kind of strange because you would think that the prices would be relatively close and that there would be arbitrage opportunities if they pulled apart. And the arbitrage opportunities would mean basically, look, if you see a fund trading, a closed-end fund trading at a premium, well, maybe you should short that because eventually it's going to drop down to its actual net asset value, its fundamental value. And vice versa, if it sells at a discount, well, maybe you should buy it because it eventually it'll appreci it appreciate back up to the net asset value. Uh, that tends not to happen. And there's basically two explanations for why there can be premiums or discounts. There can be a discount because sometimes what happens is when you buy into a closed-end fund, what you're doing is you're actually buying a tax liability to some degree. So if, if you have a closed-end fund with a net, net asset value of $10, and let's say it has a capital gain in there that's about $2, so that there's going to be a capital gain distribution, a dividend to shareholders of $2. Well, if you buy at net asset value and at $10, and you immediately get a $2 dividend, you just bought yourself a tax liability. So say say the, the tax rate is, is 20%. That means 40 cents you're gonna pay in terms of taxes for nothing. You didn't really get anything in return for that because you bought the capital gain. And so the funds that have ca large capital gains will sell at a discount to take into consideration a tax liability that will be imposed on the people who get that dividend distribution. Now, funds can trade at a premium because these closed-end funds are a collection of stocks. There are portfolios. Sometimes those portfolios are attractive. And so you, with one trade, you can get that portfolio. And so there's advantage of that. Maybe it's the right combination of stocks that investors really want. And so it's got the right niche. People will tend to buy and drive up the price above net asset value. Those explanations don't fully hold water, meaning they don't fully explain the premiums or discounts. They go you know, part way in explaining those premium or discounts. And so what you have in the world of finance is called the closed end fund puzzle because of those premiums or discounts aren't full, fully explained. Now let's move into open-end funds and then the closed-end funds I think may make more sense and we'll do a compare and contrast. Open-ended funds, better known as mutual funds, are open-ended in the sense that these funds, when they do really, really well, the financial media advertises them, basically says, look, here's a ranking of the best funds last quarter. And people read those rankings and start investing in those funds, thinking that there's a really good portfolio manager. And so funds that perform well tend to get a lot of money coming in from investors. Investors start pouring their money in, which means these funds get this, get this additional money and they have to invest. And so these funds are open to new investors and new, more money, new money, and so the funds can get bigger and bigger and bigger.
And if that's the case, well, that's great for the sponsor because the sponsor collects a management fee that's a percentage of the net asset value. And so that makes a lot of sense for the sponsor that want to do that. And plus, investors are happy to chase these returns and invest in, in the funds that perform well. And if funds perform poorly, you know, people exit the fund that shrivels up and it shrinks. A special type of open-end fund is a money market fund, which we've talk, talked about briefly before. Money market funds usually have a net asset value anchored at $1, and the fund pays a dividend, a small dividend, each and every day. And then it makes it actually may make a payment every month, but it declares the dividend. The dividend just accumulates as a dividend payable liability to the fund and basically a receivable for you. You'll eventually get it at the end of the month. But money market funds are really convenient. In fact, a lot of investment company sponsors will ask you to set up a money market fund, even though your intention is to buy a stock or a bond fund. And the reason why they want you to open up also a money market fund is to use it as a, a place to move funds, that easily move funds. So if, if you liquidate some of your stock shares or your bond fund shares, you liquidate it and it goes into the money market account. Then you can write checks on it, against it, and you have some liquidity there. If you make deposits, so maybe what you want to do is deposit some money in the money market fund. And when you find that there's an attractive time to buy stock funds or bond funds, then you move the money quickly out of the money market fund and into the stock or bond fund. So it's very convenient. So now you can see with, with open-end funds now, there are shareholder servicing that's pretty extensive. So the motivation here is that, look, you have these shareholder servicing costs. How do you justify the existence of open-ended funds compared to closed-end funds? Well, again, open-ended funds are designed to get bigger and bigger and bigger if the portfolio manager is good. And that's how the, the sponsor makes their money. At this point, it's probably a good idea to do a compare and contrast between closed-end funds and open-ended funds. In a sense, we've already done that, but I want to pick up on something that you may not already know and we haven't talked about so far, about open-ended funds. Open-ended funds, in one sense, are very inconvenient. And the reason for that is shares are priced just once a day at 4 o'clock when the stock market closes. The fund computes a net asset value. And any money that you sent into the fund that day gets invested at the, that net asset value that they compute at 4 o'clock. You send your money in after 4 o'clock, the money won't get invested until 24 hours later when the market closes, the next business day when the market closes at 4 o'clock. It only prices once per day. So money sits and accumulates all day, they collect it, and then it gets invested at the net asset value that's computed at the end of the day. So in that sense, if you want to trade funds, they're not very good at that. You, you can't really do that. They're good if you want to lock your money up for retirement or save for a long term, it's great. But if you want to do trading, that's where closed end funds come in because closed end funds trade like a stock. You buy them from a broker. You can, you can buy them, you can short them, you can use margin with them, having a margin account with them. So don't get me wrong, open-ended funds, there's trillions of dollars in those things. They're great investment vehicles, but you just can't trade. If you're interested in darting in and out of the market with these things, you can only do it once a day. And then you send your money in, you send your money in at two or three in the afternoon, you don't really know what price you're going to get because you don't know what the price of the market will be and the shares that are in the portfolio. And you won't know until the fund prices its portfolio at 4 o'clock. It prices its portfolio at 4 o'clock, but it's not till 5.50, at least till 5.50 in the evening when those mutual funds send that information to the financial networks and media, you know, like the Wall Street Journal and other financial media. Pretty soon, we'll come up to ETFs, and ETFs are even more convenient than a closed-end fund. ETFs are quite flexible I mean that you can trade them all day from 9.30 when the market opens till 4 o'clock. You can short them, and not only that, ETFs are open-ended. 
They don't have premiums or discounts. And the portfolios associated with ETFs are usually index funds. They don't have to be, but they're usually indexed funds, whereas closed-end funds tend to be actively managed. Closed-end funds are passive. Now, the next type of fund is called a hedge fund. These are usually open to wealthy investors, what are often called accredited investors. Investors usually with a net worth of a couple of million dollars, and you got to read the prospectus to find out what those cutoffs are. And hedge funds, despite their name, usually the word hedge means that they're reducing risk. It's generally not the case. They often have very sophisticated, highly risky portfolios. And because those portfolios are highly risky and they could be in illiquid securities, most hedge funds have a window that opens up when you can, you can deposit money or withdraw money out of the fund. That's important because when you look at open-ended funds and you want to get your money out, you just request a, a withdrawal and within a couple of days you'll get your money back. But with a hedge fund, you may have to wait for the end of the quarter, and you may only have a window of a couple of days in which to do that transaction. Now, hedge funds charge different fees than, say, open-ended funds. So open-ended funds, they usually have, for example, management fees and other fees that are, you know, let's just say they're about a half a percent. Hedge funds may have fees of about 2%. So constant 2% fees versus a half a percent for open-ended funds. Now, with open-ended funds, they have that lower expense rate, but there's also no performance fee. And a performance fee is where the fund manager gets some of the profits that they earn. And that's where hedge funds come in. Hedge funds have what's called a performance fee. So they may have a fee structure that's called a a 2 slash 20 and what a 2 slash 20 fee structure means that the fund always no matter what happens charges a 2% fee like a like a management type fee and then takes 20% of the profits above what's called a high water mark so they don't take profits well you can't take profits when you have losses so hedge funds have losses what do you how do you handle that well that's where a high water mark concept comes into play let me transition over to a, a marker so that I can show you visually how a high water mark works for hedge funds. So high water marks work like this. Suppose we have the net asset value of a fund over time of a hedge fund looking like this. What happens is the, the performance fee that the portfolio manager charges will be 20% of the total return of the fund right up to this point call a high water mark you know it's kind of like what you see on buildings when there was a flood so it's the mark it's the high water mark at the moment so along these dash lines the portfolio manager is collecting a 20 percent fee but then when performance starts turning negative it doesn't make sense to charge any fees otherwise the what would happen is the the shareholders would be charging a fee to the portfolio manager, that's not going to happen. So the portfolio manager doesn't charge any fees on the downward end, okay? Because it just doesn't make sense. And then even when it rebounds here, it rebounds. It does not charge performance fees because it's just recouping where it was in the past based on the old this high water mark. It's only once it passes this high water mark in this hatched line here is where performance fees will continue to be charged. So therefore, that on that downward dip, there's no charge. And so that gives portfolio managers an incentive to perform really well. Yeah, so open-ended funds just don't have that mechanism. They don't have performance fees like hedge funds do. Now, the next type of fund we want to look at is called exchange-traded funds. These are really, really popular, kind of changed the landscape of the investment company world. Exchange-traded funds are really interesting because they can trade all day long like a stock so remember we looked at the closed end fund it basically did an ipo you buy them you buy a closed end fund from a broker you can buy them you can short them all day okay? but um, with an exchange traded fund you can do the same thing you can buy and sell exchange traded funds all day they often mimic indexes or any really any niche any area of the market that you can assemble a portfolio somebody has it out there because there's literally hundreds and maybe even some thousand maybe even thousands of ETFs out there of different kinds 
But unlike closed-end funds, exchange-traded funds are open in the sense that if an exchange-traded fund does really well, investors are going to start pouring their money into it, and that exchange-traded fund is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the sponsor of that exchange-traded fund is going to collect more management fees and is going to be quite happy. I mean, that's all ultimately the goal of sponsors like Vanguard and Fidelity is that they want to generate really popular mutual funds that investors buy, have more assets under management. That's generally what it's referred to is like they have trillions of dollars of assets under management and they want it to get bigger because they collect a percentage of that trillion dollars or more. So exchange traded funds allow that to happen. But what's really cool is there there's lots of them out there. You can enter them anytime you want. You can short them when you want. So you, you can leverage up if you want. You can buy them on margin. So it's quite an interesting area. Very, very popular with investors nowadays. Now, there are some funds. They're often ETFs that are called leveraged funds. These are funds that are designed to take advantage of leverage and spike returns. And so you often see these leveraged funds with a 2x or a 3x in front of their or within their name somewhere. What 2x means is leverage so that if the underlying portfolio, say it's, say it's trying to mimic the S&P, but if the S&P goes up 1% for the day and it's a 2x fund, then this fund will go up twice as much. It's designed to go up twice as much as the underlying S&P. Now, if the S&P falls 1%, then this fund will drop 2%. So it's a double-edged sword here. But that's what leverage funds do. They borrow money. They use options and futures contracts to leverage themselves up and magnify returns. What's interesting is that these things are great. You really can predict where the market's going in the short term, which is nearly impossible. Well, let's assume that you could do that. Then these things are pretty interesting and can be pretty valuable if you pretty much can predict what's going to happen the next day. The problem with these funds is that over the long run, the math just works against you in that when you're in a 2x fund, over time with the volatility that these funds have, your gains are going to be eroded. And let me let me show you what I mean by how the fund can be eroded with volatility with a 2x or a 3x fund. So let's move over to a marker. So here's how performance can work against you in these leveraged funds. Let's assume you have a 2x fund and let's compare it to a 1x fund, which is what everything else is. Nobody just call it, nobody calls it a 1x fund. It's just a one fund. There's no leverage. So here's here's how it works. Let's assume you start out with $100 and then you get a 10% return. That means you're going to end up at $110, right? And then you're going to lose 10%. So if you lose 10%, you're down to 0.90% is what's left. You end up with $99. Now what's interesting about this is one day you made 10% and the next day you lost 10%. You would think, okay, I made 10%, I lost 10%, I should be even back at 100 bucks where I started. Not so, because in this situation, you got $99. Now let's take a 2x1. So that's the effect of compounding, by the way. That's caused by a difference in the geometric versus arithmetic averaging that was discussed in chapter one. Now, I don't care if you know how to actually calculate the statistics that try to tease out the implications of the difference between arithmetic and geometric, but you should be able to do this basic kind of math, like in an example. So Let's look at a, at a 2x fund under the same scenario of a 10% increase in the underlying portfolio, say the S&P, and then a drop of 10% in the S&P, but the fund is leveraged up somehow. It's using options, futures, or borrowed money somehow, some way to leverage itself. So we start off with 100 like before, but now instead of going up 1.1, it's going to go up 1.2, right? 20% because it's leveraged. And then it's not going to drop 10%, it's going to drop 20%. So this becomes 0.8. What happens is you're now at $96. You went up 20%, down 20%, but look at what happened because of the compounding. You're down $4. Even though mathematically, arithmetically, I should say, arithmetically, you broke even. You know, at a 20% negative 20% return. 
That's not the way it works, actually, mathematically. My point being here is that you, if you buy a 2x, even if a 3x is even worse, because it's going to magnify this effect that I'm showing you even worse. My point is that if you go into these 2x and 3x funds, over the long run, you're going to, your returns are going to get eaten away because of this volatility. Now let's move on to exchange traded notes. Exchange traded notes look a, ETNs look a lot like ETFs, but they're not. So as I've been talking to you over the past two videos, is that there's a net asset value, which is equity that you buy into a fund. You're buying you're an equity owner when you buy into a into a mutual fund, an open ended fund, a closed end fund, a hedge fund an exchange traded fund, a leverage fund, but with the exchange traded notes, you're actually, in a sense, you're a creditor. You lent money to a company, and not only that, it's subordinated debt. And so you need to be very careful. So there's not that many of them, but it's important that you be aware of them. They tend to fill a niche where ETFs don't really come into play. When you buy an ETF, for example, closed-end fund, open-end fund, or hedge fund, those funds actually own securities, a portfolio of underlying securities. And so when those underlying securities go up or down, then the net asset value goes up and down, and your wealth as a shareholder goes up and down. But with exchange-traded creditor, they don't actually buy an underlying asset. And a really good example of this is with the VIX, the volatility index. There's a volatility index that's measured and computed by the Chicago Board of Options Exchange that measures the volatility that's implied in the stock market using options contracts on the S&P 500. It's rather involved. It's covered in financial engineering to some degree, but it's a measure of volatility. Some people call it the fear index, the VIX, the volatility index, and X stands for index usually when you read a ticker symbol, and volatility V. So it's a volatility index, and you can't actually go out in the market and buy volatility because there's nobody issuing a, you know, there's no company that issues volatility. It's just a number that's calculated by the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, and it tends to spike when the stock market drops. In other words, when the fear index goes up, the VIX shoots way up, and stocks tend to drop because when people get nervous, investors get nervous, they sell stocks. So investing in the VIX makes some sense because it'll help stabilize your portfolio. So in good times, the VIX is just moving along relatively stable. It won't do anything to your portfolio. But if your portfolio is about to drop and you actually buy the VIX, it's going to offset your big losses. So that's where these ETNs come into play. But like I said, these ETNs, they're not actually buying the VIX. They're just tracking the VIX, mechanically tracking the VIX. And it's basically debt. You've lent money to a big financial institution. And that's my point. You don't really have equity. So if you really trust the financial institution that you've lent money to, then maybe you know, you're know you okay with ETNs. But I w would warn you to be careful that with things turn sour, financial institutions have credit risk. In other words, they're probability of going bankrupt increases in a recession and that's when the volatility index jumps and so just when you need insurance that ins basically the insurance company could disappear on you in a sense that's, I guess that's a good way to, to look at it now let's move into private equity private equity is a really broad area and it's usually as the word indicates the term private they invest in things that are not publicly traded and things that are not publicly traded tend not to be very liquid and so you can't find you, you can't buy a mutual fund as an individual investor that trades private equity that invests in private equity typically to invest in private equity you need to be an accredited investor with several million dollars and they're set up with a partnership structure so there's a general partner that assumes a lot of liability and has an investment in these securities and then there's limited partners and limited means it's limited liability for those partners but they generally earn less of a return private equity is often used in venture capital so you got this young startup company it hasn't issued any shares publicly it's too small it's too young it's not stable it hasn't really developed its product yet 
but venture capitalists will look at that company, invest in it. They'll buy shares. The shares just are not, they're not publicly traded. Not only will they buy shares, they'll put themselves on the board of directors and they'll actually manage the, the company because usually what happens is you got these entrepreneurs that are really good at their product and developing their product, but they have no idea how to manage a company. And that's where the venture capitalists come in. They're not going to part with their money, one, uh, one, unless they're an equity owner, and two, they got some control over how the company is run. And it's basically a strikeout or home run scenario where a lot of these private equity investments in venture capital, something like three or four out of ten will fail, three or four or less will be okay, and maybe one or two will be a home run. And so that's how venture capitals work. They're looking for the home runs, but they often strike out. And that's that's the nature of venture capital. Another example of private equities with leverage buyouts. A common situation where a leverage buyout works something like this. Suppose the management of a publicly traded firm become convinced that they could manage the business a lot better if they didn't have to report to the public who holds the shares. And so management becomes convinced, you know, if we were the actual owners of the company, the company would perform a whole lot better, the stock price would rise in value, and we'd all be better off. And so, so with the help of a private equity department of a large financial institution, management can borrow money, buy the shares out from the public, turn the company around, have it perform better, and then ultimately sell the shares at a much higher price in the future. So that's one way to create a private equity investment. Now, moving right along, the next type of, and the last type of fund that we're going to look at are REITs, real estate investment trusts. Now, these are a bit different in that when you buy into a real estate investment trust, they're buying real estate. And you just don't buy real estate, in commercial, mainly commercial real estate, by the way, and just let it sit. It's not like a stock. You buy a stock and you can just shove the, the certificates in a drawer, so to speak, like they did years ago, and just let it ride. But if you own real estate, you got to manage it and have property managers who, who are responsible for maintenance and groundskeeping. So when you buy into a real estate investment trust, you're actually not only buying real estate, you're also responsible for the property management of it and the maintenance. And not only that, but REITs can also be leveraged to some degree, and they borrow money. Closed-end funds, open-ended funds generally do not borrow any money. Hedge funds will borrow money. Exchange-traded funds tend not to borrow any money, except if they're leveraged funds that we talked about, the 2X and 3X. They can be leveraged. Private equity can be leveraged, and REITs can be leveraged. So REITs provide an interesting risk and return trade-off now because real estate is a separate asset class. And given that they're a separate asset class, they're going to be less correlated with stocks and bonds. And so this could add a, some good measure of diversification for you. The same goes with private equity. Private equity can provide some really good diversification for you. And since it's very illiquid and it's privately managed, private equity can have really good returns, really good excess, excess returns on a risk-adjusted basis. So when you look at risk-adjusted returns of private equity, it can be really good. So there you have it, a summary of the various types of investment companies or funds that exist in the financial markets today. I simply could not do it justice in under 35 minutes. The field is extremely broad. I have, I have textbooks that are three inches thick that just cover venture capital. Other voluminous textbooks that cover private equity and others that just cover stock funds. Nevertheless, it is insightful to try to categorize and summarize these investment types.